Well, good evening, everybody, as we uh, join together for another Kahima Educational Trust webinar. We'll just wait a few moments to allow everyone across the globe to log on, uh, as is our usual practice. It's uh, lovely to see so many people having registered to join tonight and forwarding on the invitation to their friends. We've got people from uh, literally all around the world uh, joining us tonight to hear Harry Fiesert talk about the East Africans in the Burma campaign. And it's good to see lots of old friends joining us again and a number of newcomers as well. I was talking to Sylvia before the um, before we went live and she said that they were, this was our 15th, I can't believe it, in the last couple of years um, since COVID forced us all online. But it's been an exciting new way to enable us all to talk together about um, Kahima and the war that uh, surrounded the, um, the events, those great events in 1944. Really good to see you all here. Um, we'll be uh, going live in a moment and I'll introduce Harry, but uh, let's just give a few more minutes for people to, to join. And um, if you want to say hello, stick your... Um, Felicitations in the chat box, and uh, well, if we've got time, we're sure we'll, 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 we will certainly try to have time for questions at the end. Stick your uh, questions in the Q and A box, and uh, we'll if we don't answer them during the session, we'll certainly do by email afterwards. Well, that's enough from me. Uh, I'll hand over to Sylvia May, who's the chief executive of the Kahima Educational Trust. Thank you, Sylvia. Thank you, Rob, and good evening, everyone, and welcome back to so many of our regulars and a, a big hearty welcome to all of our new viewers tonight who have joined our latest Kahima Educational Trust webinar. Tonight, the subject is all about the East African contribution to the Burma campaign, and I'm delighted to welcome back author and historian Harry Fiesit, who, in conversation with Dr. Lyman, will talk to us about the operational activities of these African troops in Burma during World War II. It's full of fascinating insights and maps, and I can guarantee that some of you will be saying, well, I didn't know that. Joining Harry is the wonderful Dr. Robert Lyman, author, military historian, and we're very lucky to have him as a KET trustee. His book, War of Empires, is now out in paperback, published by Osprey, and his forthcoming book, Reconquest of Burma, will be out in July, and we will have copies available in York. I know that, um, you, as Rob's already said, there's so many of you from all over the world, and I know one in particular is watching from um, Kenya. Hello, Freddie, and several of you have close involvement with the subject, so I hope you can sit back and enjoy. Please do use the chat button and all the Q&A button, and we will take questions at the end. But as always, if we run out of time, please feel free to email and um, both Rob and Harry will get to your questions afterwards. Now, over to you, Rob. Thank you very much, Sylvia. And it gives me great pleasure to welcome back to the KET webinars, our friend Harry Fiesert, who joined us last year for a conversation about the book that he and Charles Chasey wrote, uh, the Road to Kahima, which for the first time exposed to uh, our views, the um, experiences of uh, indigenous people, not just the Nagas, but indigenous people across uh, the northeast of India uh, to the, the war in 1944 and 1945. And you will know from listening to these webinars that this is a particular focus of our interest that we um, listen perhaps really for the first time in a, in a long time to the um, experiences of those who lived through uh, those great events so long ago. But Harry is a, uh, a very good friend of the Kahima Educational Trust. He's also a very um, experienced writer, and I'm certainly in debt to Harry in many fronts for the research he's undertaken. In particular, and looking at tonight, he's uh, produced uh, two volumes on the King's African Rifle. So we're talking here about the East Africans, and that's the focus for tonight. We thought uh, in conversation that doing the East and the West Africans tonight would just be a little bit uh, too much. So we'll reserve a webinar uh, next year to the West Africans. But Harry's going to talk us through the particular contribution made by units of the, the East Africans to the 14th Army. 
and Harry, we're delighted to have you uh, with us tonight. Um, let me just quickly set the scene again for uh, all of those who need reminding. I don't think it's many of you. Uh, you know the situation in Burma in 1944 and 45. Um, this map essentially highlights the, the places of geographical interest where the East Africans were involved. Um, Harry's going to walk us through the particular units involved. Uh, from the uh, uh, the 11th uh, East African Division in particular and two additional brigades. We're talking about Arakan, which is the coastal littoral uh, of Burma and, um, and India that runs along the Bay of Bengal. You can see that down there under uh, um, number four. Uh, uh, number two and number three talk about the operations down the the Gangor or the Mayetha Valley, the same place, it's the long valley that runs along parallel to the Chindwin and operations were undertaken there as a precursor to crossing the Chindwin and, uh, and launching an offensive into Burma in November and December 1944. Uh, and then under bullet point five, uh, the operations undertaken in 1945 as a diversionary exercise, which Harry will talk uh, about later in support of Slim's great feint across the Irrawaddy. So that's the geography of tonight's conversation. I'm going to start again with this slide, which has become something of a favourite of mine. If you've been on these webinars before, you will have seen it at least twice, maybe three times before. But I think right at the start of tonight's webinar in particular, we simply need to remind ourselves about what I describe as the numbers game. So in Southeast Asian Command in 1945, towards the end of the war, when numbers had reached their peak, there were just over 1.3 million men and a few women in Southeast Asia Command, that command um, commanded by uh, Lord Louis Mountbatten. And of that number, 58% of those 1.3 million were Indians. An amazing 21%, so nearly 300,000 in the gray box on the right-hand side were Americans. In the green, not box, in the, uh, circle, egg, in the green circle, we have 8% or 100,000 Brits. And in the middle uh, egg there, we have 90,000. And the numbers go up and down slightly depending on what we're counting, but a total of 90,000 um, Africans, West and East Africans. So that's quite an extraordinary number, isn't it? Just think about that. We had very nearly the same number of Africans fighting in Southeast Asia Command as we had Brits. And it's always a a staggering thing to contemplate when, of course, we certainly in Britain have adopted this uh, mythology, I'm afraid, that the war in the Far East was our war fought by our boys uh, for our purposes. And uh, I think this simple slide demonstrates that that just wasn't the case. So we're delighted to be able to uh, spend a little bit of time tonight talking about a very significant group of, of men uh, who were represented in that 7%. And the smaller circle, the smaller egg, uh, represents Chinese forces, most of whom were fighting with Stillwell's troops, um, the Northern Combat Area Command, in the northeast of Burma. Right, and that's enough from me. I'm going to hand over to Harry. I'll control the slides, but Harry's now going to introduce us to uh, the African or the East African contribution. Well, no, the African contribution in Burma. Harry, over to you. Right, thank you, and good evening to everybody. I'd just like to tell you why I'm actually involved in this. Uh, I was very fortunate in my life some years ago to uh, serve as an infantry officer in four different armies. The British Army was my um, apprenticeship, but then I uh, went in three others where I I wasn't on a training team. I was commanding troops, Africans, Asians, and Arabs. And I learned a lot from them. Uh, and now in retirement, I am a bit fed up with the lack of attention our historians, popular historians, give to the empire soldiers, of, particularly from Africa and India. Uh, in the Second World War. So that's where I come from. And uh, I, I'm going to now 
talk about uh, what was the 11th East African Division. Well, it was a standard infantry division of, of three brigades, and each brigade had uh, three battalions. The soldiers were all um, young Africans, and they were volunteers. They're, they were not conscripted. Um, they, they received good food in, when they joined up, and that, because they didn't always get a good diet uh, where they were back in Africa. But the army filled them out and made them strong. But they came with some qualities, particularly good hearing and powers of observation and patience. And that made them uh, excellent jungle soldiers. And they didn't come as new boys into the theater of war. They, they had fought against the Italians in East Africa when we, uh, along with South African and West African and Indian troops, we reoccupied the protectorate of Somaliland, which the Italians had taken off us. And then we went into Abyssinia, or call it Ethiopia, and we restored Emperor Haile Selassie to his throne. And now that was tough fighting because the Italians weren't a pushover. They had tanks, uh, which, you know, is quite a shock for anyone. <laughs> First time you, you see them, especially if it's coming for you. So after that, which that campaign is not well known. After that, there was another campaign that's even less well known. And that was fighting the Vichy French in Madagascar. When the Germans occupied France, the, uh, the French formed a government in the town of Vichy. And basically, it was a collaborationist government with the Germans. Um, this was before de Gaulle got going with his free French. And then uh, when the Japanese came in, uh, the Japanese had <clears throat> an interest in, in in East Africa, which I'll describe in a minute, but it meant that the Vichy French also collaborated, started collaborating with Japan uh, in, in Madagascar. Now, looking at, I'm not going to get as bogged down in the divisional order of battle. It's here on the screen, but it's a standard division. At, apart from the infantry, as you can see, there are the usual artillery engineers, signals, medical, ordnance, service corps, electrical and mechanical, and military police. Interestingly, the casualty clearing station was from the Belgian Congo. Uh, and it had one interesting feature about it. The Belgians in the Congo still used flogging as a punishment. So, Sometimes the rest of the division or what was near the casualty clearing station would see the, the Belgians coming out and flogging somebody. Well, before anyone gets too excited about that, if you were in a British Chindit brigade uh, and you were looking for a parachute airdrop which had gone in the jungle and you went with your mate, you found it, my God, it had chocolate in, you filled your pockets, if you came back and were apprehended as having looted that, the, the British RSM uh, just <laughs> uh, bent you over and flogged you. Well, that was a, a recognized punishment. What we're really talking about is fighting in a theater like Burma, which is outside uh, the normal conventions of what you expect people to do. Anyway, that's the, that's the division. Initially, it had no tanks in support of it. Now, this is quite important because uh, later on in the Burma plain, infantry and tanks worked very closely and uh, the tanks were of enormous use in taking out Japanese uh, bunkers. But in the beginning, uh, this, the, the ground I'm going to describe was so rough that tanks weren't there. However, 
ground air to air <coughs> support, ground attack air support was on demand when the weather could permit it. So that was a division. There were two other brigades, which I will describe separately each. And they, they weren't in the division Orbat. They were meant to be relief brigades to be pushed into the Orbat if needed. But the shortage of manpower was such in Burma that the brigades were used individually, and I'll talk about them later. Right, if we look at the map, we can see where nearly all the soldiers come from. Kenya, Uganda, Tanganyika Territory, which is now Tanzania, Nyasaland, which is now Malawi, Northern Rhodesia, which is Zambia, and Southern Rhodesia, which is Zimbabwe. So quite a mix of lads. And what you'll notice when I tell you briefly who was in each brigade, there was always three di different countries represented uh, in, in each brigade. Right. Do you want to say anything about the West Africans in the Arakan, uh, Rob, before I quickly describe what the East African scouts did? Well, it's simply important to remember that the, um, the, there was a West African, uh, actually there were two West African divisions, one of three brigades, one of two, that operated uh, throughout 1943 into 1945. As I said at the start, well, this will be a subject of a webinar we'll have next year. But it was quite an extraordinary uh, effort by the West Africans. But actually, they didn't really work together with the exception of the, the scouts, which, uh, which Harry will describe. Yes, for some strange re right. Well, can, can we put up the scouts uh, slide and it, it, it'll tell you, tell us why the scouts were, that's it, yes. The, 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 it, this is an interesting point about the war and the Japanese involvement in it. Well before World War II started, the Japanese were positioning themselves around the places uh, they wanted to uh, occupy later for basically for economic or strategic reasons. Um, in, in Asia particularly, a lot of Japanese um, dentists and photographers appeared in towns and they were quite popular because they were efficient. But they also had a, another role, which was really to work as intelligence informers. So the Japanese were getting feet out on the ground uh, in a hidden fashion. Now, I've mentioned that they had an interest in, uh, in Vichy Madagascar. It was also strange that just before World War II started, the um, Japanese were good enough to do a, a, a fishery survey of the Kenya coast. And uh, once they'd come into the war, it was realized, well, they, they now know every nook and cranny on our coast, should they, they want to use it. So if East African scouts were formed specifically to do uh, a role of um, reconnoitering all the coastal areas that um, the Japs might fit into, and they were, they were not trained to be proper infantry. But the sad thing is, when, when the division was moved out from Ceylon, where it had, Sri Lanka, it had done a lot of good jungle training, the scouts were sent into the Arakan. Um, and the inevitable happened. They did some scouting in the Arakan, but they were regarded as standard infantry and they were put into a defensive position, which they didn't have the equipment or the experience for. And they took a hammering there. And uh, the Japanese, especially artillery, if you've not been trained on routines in defense, uh, artillery can frighten you. But if, if you've got the right overhead cover and uh, the right procedures, it, it's not so frightening. 
just makes you a bit deaf, like I am now. Anyway, uh, there was a hill called Pagoda Hill, which the scouts were defending, and they, the Japanese overran them. Uh, a lot of the scouts didn't like this, uh, and they jumped out of the trenches and uh, run, run back to get away from them. Anyway, the situation was restored, as usual, by um, officers and, and senior NCOs and the warrant officers getting around there at great risk to themselves and uh, getting the men back in the trenches and, and fighting again. But it, it really was the end of the scouts because the um, people running in the, the show in Arakan said, well, they're not, not a lot of use, are they? Um, because they'd been misused. Now, I'll just I'm, for each of the battles I'll take you through, I'm going to mention a man of the match. I'll call him a man of the action. And this one was Captain James Stevenson in the East African Scouts, but uh, seconded from the British Army, the Loyal Regiment, North Lancashire, uh, which I'm proud to say I was commissioned into uh, so far ago. I can't remember. Anyway, he was, the, he was the kind of chap, he was with the forward company, he was out of his trench, he was running around, giving orders, steadying them down, getting people uh, back fighting again, uh, and he got a, middle, a military cross for it. But after that, the scouts were disbanded and dispersed along the, uh, the rest of the division. Right, I've got a, we've got a plaque to look at, haven't we? for the scouts, yes. This plaque takes me into the next slide, which is the massive, massive war memorial uh, down near Rangoon, the Rangoon Memorial. Um, you saw over 40 scouts' names there, and they are on the concrete pillars that are supporting the roof of that memorial. There, there are thousands and thousands of names there. And a lot of them are Africans, and I'll talk about that just finally, how many Africans' names are there. The, there are also graves, as you can see. But one of the problems about fighting in Burma is not many men, dead men, could be recovered to be put in the kind of Commonwealth war graves cemeteries that we see all around Europe. Um, once we get into what it was like, the conditions, you'll quickly see that um, a chap who was killed, you, know where to, you had nowhere to put him. The, the, you couldn't send bodies back. They were decomposing. You had to get them underground. If you buried them in the jungle, well, they were never going to be found. So they tended to be buried on the side of the tracks because there were graves registration people coming along and the unit padre would try and recall where everybody was. But after a torrential rain, you know, a bulldozer coming down the track could just literally obliterate any notice of the graves. Anyway, the <clears throat> that's why there are so many people on those columns. Uh, and it sort of upsets some people who think, well, why aren't they in cemeteries? Well, these were just the conditions of, uh, of Burma. I think there now, are about 6,000 graves, aren't there, Harry, and about 28,000 names. So quite yes. a, quite a yes. significant difference. Yeah. Now, do you want me to go on to the Cabo Valley and the, the Tans? Before we do that, right. we can talk about the, uh, the problems of transport and how the Japanese overcame them. Yeah, these are two good pictures, actually. I like the one on the left. The Japs were can-do people. If they didn't, they did have trucks in Burma, but when they were in situations where there were no roads, then um, chaps with bicycles would get supplies forward. And when we talk about Japs ensconcing themselves in the middle of the jungles, we will in a minute, uh, they were resupplied in this manner. Um, so, the Jap was not to be taken lightly. He, he, if he was dug in to fight, he was given his basic uh, supplies 
as long as he wasn't encircled. Now on the right, uh, are elephants. Now, pre-war, the Burma Forestry Service employed a lot of elephants who were trained to handle logs because feet logging was a, a big uh, economic uh, boom to Burma. When the British evacuated themselves from Burma, the, the elephants stayed in their groups under the previous um, Burmese men who'd been looking after them. Well, the Japanese soon got hold of what they could. Um, some, were, some of the elephant groups were moved across the border into India, and they then supported what the British were doing. And here you see men of the East African Division and a load of kit, which uh, is on the back of the of the elephant. Uh, and I'm, I will mention um, elephants again uh, a bit later. Uh, but right, Cabo Valley. You, if you can see it on the map, it's basically in the center of the map. The, the division was given a task, clear the Cabo Valley of the Japanese and build a rough road down. There wasn't a road there, there was just a mule track. But that was only half the story. As well as clear the Cabo Valley, they, the division had to move eastwards. You can see arrows going to the right from the main valley because Part of the task was to get rid of all the Japanese between the Cabo Valley and the River Chindwin and get across the Chindwin and form bridgeheads. Now, this was, a, a, in monsoon weather, it was a very difficult task to handle. Uh, and it needed tough guys who weren't going to go down, uh, you know, go sick first time they, they got a cold. So, with rain coming down at five inches a day, um, men were never dry. Uh, malaria and scrub typhus was rampant. Cooking was difficult. Apart from fighting the Japanese, constant fights against muddy roads that impeded the advance of supporting artillery were, as we'll see in a, in a slide uh, shortly, made the whole thing difficult. Resupply was sometimes by Indian muleteers or, or airdrops normally. But the Japanese were in good positions. Our biggest, one of our biggest problems in Burma in situations like this was casualty, casualty evacuation. That was really easy. And just, now, I'll, I'll just leap in here um, and just, just explain the context of uh, the Cabo Valley, it's also known as the Maeta Valley, um, depending on which way you're traveling. But of course, this was at the end of the great battle of, um, of Imphal and Kahima, of course, in 1944. And Slim was given instructions in late June to uh, progress uh, uh, the uh, operations against the Japanese uh, into Burma. Uh, at that time, the instructions were simply to push them to the, to, to the Burmese border, which is effectively the Chindwin and uh, the uh, 11th East Africans and the 5th Indian Division were given the responsibility of doing precisely what Harry has just described. Right, and we'll look at that top black arrow going to the right. Uh, that's 25 East African Brigade, and the battalions were from Kenya, Uganda, and Tanganyika territory. They advanced on that rough track, uh, which took them to sit down on the Chindwin, but they had a, they had quite a tough fight first on a place called uh, Jambo Hill, and they had quite a bit to learn about how um, how the Japanese fought. Um, the first European in the division was killed on this hill at Jambo Hill, despite having blacked his face up, because the Europeans soon officers and senior ranks soon realized that um, the Japanese just zeroed in on anything that looked like a white man. But the, uh, one of the problems had been 
in charge is you might black your face up, but if you're standing there giving orders to people, right, the Japs would zero in on you anyway. Anyway, they, they, they got down to uh, and across the Sitai, the wrong, the Chinwin. And this was important because um, the, the rivers were used by the Japs for transport in a big way. But by getting um, across, then uh, the river's quite wide, five or 600 meters there. Uh, with machine guns on both sides, they could uh, eliminate Japanese boats or rafts coming down, down the river. Anyway, this was the first achievement by a East African brigade. They were replaced by an Indian uh, brigade who went across the river and uh, pushed the Japs back from anywhere near, near the Chinwin. And they, the, the 25 brigade was withdrawn back into Indian territory and retrained and was introduced later into the Cabo Valley. But the, the, I'll just mention one of the action. There were two of them. And um, at one point on uh, the fighting on Jambo Hill, an unexpected Jap machine gun opened up and it was at a critical time. The attack could have collapsed. But uh, Corporal Malakwen Sitieni and Private Kazulu Niaka from Kenya each received a military medal for what they did. When this machine gun opened up, uh, Corporal Sitiani engaged it with a brain gun and Private Kazulu uh, crept up in dead ground, which means ground that the enemy can't see you moving in. Uh, and he put grenades into the machine gun post. Now, what's important to me is we're talking about experienced soldiers here. Obviously, these two had fought the uh, Italians and very probably had fought the Vichy French as well. So if you're happy, I'll go down and look at uh, 21 Brigade now. Well done. Oops. Right, this was a tough one. Sorry. The battalions concerned were one from Nyasaland, one from Uganda, and one from northern Rhodesia. Interestingly, uh, the northern Rhodesia had now Zambia had its own regiment. It wasn't part of the KAR. It was a northern Rhodesia regiment. But the um, training and uh, everything was similar to KAR, so it, the northern and southern Rhodesians could just join a, a KAR brigade and um, fit in. Right, they, they were, the brigade set off down towards the Chindwin, but they came across very large uh, hills blocking the track that they were on. Several of them, not just one. People, the main one was Lake Hill, but it, uh, it, it actually slowed up the advance for a month because the, the lads couldn't get up the steep sides of the hill easily. They, uh, they were knocked back and the Japanese were fighting well. Anyway, after a month, it, it was done and it was done for because people like um, the man of the action Platoon Sergeant Major Yawari bin Odong from Uganda. And what that rank means, he was a Sergeant Major who commanded a platoon. During the Lake Hill fighting, as it was getting to its crisis, he hobbled forward, leading his men into the enemy objective and killed four Japanese and captured their machine gun. The brigade then got down to the Chinwin, but it lost 150 men. Uh, casualties. So they were, um, I guess, quite pleased that the whole Lake Hill saga was over. Right now, here's an interesting little battle. Uh, just fought by one battalion, but it had, did have support from uh, Ugandans and from a, a mortar battery. 
the fifth KAR went to down a track where it had been told there were there were some Japs, and it arrived at a place called Letzigan. The the Japs occupied the commanding feature, but they had dug themselves in and wired it. Uh, two separate positions. And, and at the beginning, the, the British didn't work out that there were two separate positions. They thought it was one big perimeter. So when the first um, recce's were made, it was made on a false assumption. Anyway, a good plan was worked out and uh, 5 KR seized the enemy held feature, but at a price. 15, 14 Ascari killed, four officers and 79 Ascari wounded. Now that presented a big Kazivak problem, getting those back across uh, upper track. But luckily the, the mortar platoon, the mortar battery, because uh, you needed four men to carry a bloke with a broken leg with a bullet wound. Uh, it's, uh, it must have been quite agonizing for the casualties going back that way, but um, it, it was the only thing to do until you could get to a jeepable road. Right, man of the action, Corporal Chilalo Gaffer. He got a military medal. His platoon commander uh, stepped up because the company commander and the 2IC got wounded. Chilalo took over the platoon, cut the enemy wire himself, and led a party forward to recover a seriously wounded comrade. Another military medal winner was a European, Sergeant Eric Bull. He um, led his platoon in a bayonet charge through the enemy wire in the face of point blank fire, and by his gallant leadership, routed the enemy, thus gaining the day. Now, there is a, a little war history of the battalion, the 5th Kenyan Battalion, KR, which you might get uh, hold of, and it has some interesting uh, reading. I'll just tell you how they solved the problem. I'll tell you very quickly of soldiers who lost their nerve and ran away. The, the new soldiers, the young lads, they got often got spooked by the Japs, what we call jitter patrols. Japs would send patrols in the dark to find out where were the British uh, strong points and machine guns. And to make those machine guns open fire, uh, they would fire themselves, the Japs, or blow bugles, or um, set off firecrackers and fireworks. Now, some of the young lads didn't like this, and three of them in 5KR took off uh, over the back of the position. Uh, but something had to be done to restore discipline. So when those lads uh, sheepishly came back next day, they were told from now on, until we tell you not to, you, you three are sleeping on your own every night outside the uh, battalion position. Well, after that, there was never any, uh, the three survived, by the way. Uh, I bet they had some sleepless nights, but uh, there was never any problem about lads running away. Right, now we're, now we're actually doing some fighting in the uh, Cabo Valley. Um, and this is 26 Brigade. One battalion from Nyasaland, one from Tanganyika, and one from Northern Rhodesia. At first, the Japanese were not too concerned with an advance down the Cabo, but what you can see is that there is an Indian division coming in on the western side. When the Japanese re realized the importance of that, they didn't want the East Africans and the Indians to uh, meet up. So the, f the fighting was a, a bit, bit more serious in the, in the valley. 
and uh, 25 Brigade, which I told you went back to India to just for a bit of retraining, that came down and uh, did the uh, two brigades then, 26 and 25, cleared the, cleared the valley. And they met with five Indian division arriving from the West. Uh, man of the action here, I'm going to throw in a few people who were not riflemen to show you, you know, how the whole divisional uh, system worked. A stretcher bearer um, in, a, in a KAR stretcher bearer company uh, called Ngareza Matak, he got a military medal. Uh, under very heavy grenade and small arms fire from enemy bunkers, only 15 yards away, he got a casualty who had fallen inside the Japanese wire onto a stretcher. Then one of his three comrades was killed and he was badly wounded and the rescue had to be aborted. But he'd done his best and he had uh, displayed immense bravery and he, he was well worth his medal. Now we're 25 Brigade is turning to the east now, and it is going down through uh, the Mayita Gorge. But let's just look at these lads. Uh, they're sitting on a 25 pounder gun. And <laughs> when I mentioned uh, they got good army rations, uh, look at the physique of them. I mean, the physique was probably good to begin with, but uh, those lads big. The one at the front, actually, I don't think he needs an elephant. He could probably uh, handle a log or two himself. But the other interesting thing is they are manning a 25 pounder. Now, who would have thought that? This is 1945. Who would have thought that before the war started? Uh, we, what we knew about back in England, about Africa, was very limited because there was no TV or anything like that. We, we had no idea that the Africans could be trained uh, to the standard that was shown by the 11th East African Division. Anyway. The fight through this gorge was difficult. Tanks had come in with the Indians, but a very steep-sided gorge, and uh, our own artillery had problems uh, hitting enemy positions that were behind steep ridges, because an artillery shell is like that. And so it, it's, it's very difficult to get it to hit there. The answer actually is mortars with a very high trajectory, it could hit them. Once, once we discovered facts like that uh, and, and knew how to work them, we fought our way down the valley and got to Kalewa, which was the main target we had to get a bridge across the river. I'm going to mention another chap, nursing orderly Simba Saidi, East African Army Medical Corps, awarded the military medal. He was attached to an infantry company uh, which suffered 14 casualties from enemy mortar and artillery fire whilst in the forming up place for an attack. Uh, when the infantry attacks, it goes into a place near the objective called the forming up place so that all the units can be put into the right position for the attack. But it, this is one big drawback here. If the enemy can observe that or predict it, uh, he can hammer you in this forming up place because there's too many men together. Um, they suffered 14 casualties, uh, but Strong leadership got the attack going. Uh, Simba Saidi patched up the 14 and, and four more from the attack, which was uh, successful. Now, I'm going to talk first about a little uh, problem, uh, morale and uh, a problem which happened when 25 Brigade sent one battalion across the Chindwin to form 
a bridge hat, which was the routine uh, uh, which the brigades did as they approached the Chinwin. There was no operational intelligence as far as I can gather. No one knew if the Japanese were there, if they were where they were. So this battalion uh, went across. Unfortunately, they lost quite a few uh, when a boat overturned. And then when they got up against the Japanese, they, they took a beating. And uh, the, the, the soldiers just couldn't understand what was going on and began to question their orders rather than obeying them. So that uh, had to be resolved. And it was by putting uh, 26 Brigade across the river uh, and the Japanese, when they saw what they were up against then, they withdrew. The, the battalion from 25 that had uh, more or less said we're not doing any more, uh, they were withdrawn and uh, put in a rear area so that the officers and warrant officers could uh, restore discipline and morale. Corporal Yukano Odur, uh, Uganda, awarded the military medal when he stayed behind to use a brain gun to cover the evacuation of wounded under enemy effective fire. That was a brave thing to do because he, he was probably um, on his own. Perhaps he had a number two with him on the gun, but once you stay behind and the lads are out of sight behind you, uh, it, it can be soul destroying, but he did his job. And, uh, well done him. Right, now we can look at what the whole idea of getting down to Kalei was. The East Africans were never intended to go further into Burma. What they were tasked to do was get down to Kalewa and then get a bridge, do the security for getting a bridgehead across the river and then a massive uh, bridge on boats that you can see. Uh, the, the, it, well, it, it, they're pontoons rather than boats. But you can look at all the metal work there and say, where did that come from? Well, it came from down the Cabo Valley where they, the lads had cleared it and built a road that trucks could get down once the monsoon rain uh, faded away. Now, another chap I'm going to introduce you to now is a signaler, Lance Corporal Kyoko Wambua from the divisional section, signal section, he, he got his military medal for spending two days out in the pounding rain, uh, maintaining his telephone lines. He was a linesman, his job was keep the line going between these various locations. And of course, um, once he got it, all his lines working, then a tree fell down or a shell came in and broke the line. So, he was at it again, checking them out. Um, right, that, having got down and got the bridge across the, 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 uh, the river at Kalewa, the East African Division was taken back into India, not to go home, but to train and be prepared for the next big strategic move, which was going to be an, an invasion of Malaya. However, in fact, the, um, the atomic bombs were dropped by the Americans before that operation was, was needed. So a lot of the, um, the Africans went back into, um, into India and uh, relaxed. Now, we're going to look at one of the two independent brigades here. The first is 28th, and this is an important brigade because it did by far the most heavy fighting of the lot. And uh, it included the one country that wasn't on that map we showed you. It had troops from Uganda and Tanganyika but also a battalion from Somaliland up in the north of East Africa, opposite Aden. 
and the Somalis were part of the KAR organization, but uh, they weren't really keen to be in the KAR. They, they wanted to be in the, uh, in the Indian Army. They considered that was more of them. However, when it came to fighting, there was nobody better than them. So I'm going to let Rob now paint a picture of why this brigade was marched up the Mayatavald. Um, some of you will know that uh, Slim's great plan uh, in early Jan late December, early January, late December 44, early January 1945, was to um, faint General Kimura, who believed that the entirety of the 14th Army would be heading across the Shwebo Plain on the northern side of the Irrawaddy to attack Mandalay. Uh, Slim left uh, the 33rd Corps um, to, to undertake that operation pretending all the way that they uh, comprised two corps, 33 and four, while secretly the entirety of the fourth corps, which had a very large amount of Slim's armor, um, were two regiments, in fact, would come down the uh, Gangor Valley, uh, down the road that Harry has described, making the road, in fact, as they went, uh, and then going to the Irrawaddy far to the south of um, Mandalay and crossing at a place called well, Pakaku and Nyangu. Um, the 28th East African Brigade's task was to go down and to act as a as a um, as a diversion, in fact, further to the south of um, Nyangu, opposite Chalk, to um, present a threat to the Japanese at their Yanungyong uh, oil fields. And this was quite a complex move. It was done very, very quickly. In fact, it was done in about a month. And it was quite a remarkable set of operations because the Japanese, of course, were quite strong on the side of the river. They were nevertheless expecting the major part of Slim's uh, offensive to take place in the north, but this entire area needed to be cleared and fierce fighting was undertaken. And of course, as the East Africans moved down to Chalk uh, to threaten Yanning Yang, the Japanese uh, believed that this was a, 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 a considerable op operation. Um, and heavy fighting was undertaken, not least for by the Somalis. Uh, back to you, Harry, to talk about your man of the match. Yes, I've just said I'd mentioned elephants again. Uh, the brigade used elephants, actually, advancing up the Mayotte Valley. The Japanese had laid a lot of trees down across it. So Elephants were brought forward um, as animals of war, and, and they cleared the track. Right. Uh, at the, um, the battle of the diversion, uh, the, the lads, the brigade, weren't in a position of defense. They were there as in a position of diversion, uh, and they they got hammered uh, by the Japanese once they realized that there was only uh, a brigade there. And one, one uh, battalion had a hard time and uh, it couldn't stand up to the uh, shock of uh, war and uh, it lost a lot of men. But, uh, but not everyone uh, you know, ran away or hid in the bottom of the trench until a Jap um, bayoneted them. Uh, Sergeant Ntambazi Alozio, uh, a Ugandan, uh, when the, his platoon position was overrun by the Japanese, his platoon commander was hit by two enemy machine guns. He immediately, immediately took over command of the platoon and rallied it. Later, he, the, con, the casualties were so heavy, he finished up his company to IC and uh, evacuated 30 wounded men back to the uh, regimental aid post. But the problem here was the location. It, it, it was the brigade hospital and the airstrip were getting shelled. And so Brigadier Dimoline in charge of the brigade pulled it back to a box position at Letsy, which you can just see. A, a box position means it's, it's for a battalion or a brigade or even a division but it's totally surrounded by the enemy. There's no front line and rear area. 
you you in a box and you you fight from within it. But uh, reinforcements turned up: an Indian infantry battalion, uh, field artillery battery, machine gun section, and tank squadron. Um, here, the Somalis came into their own. They 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 had taken over that position I've talked about earlier where uh, the shock of battle had really knocked a battalion out. They actually liked being in contact with the Japanese. They, you know, to them, that's the point of coming all this way to, to Burma. Anyway, they, uh, this, the Japs tried to take out the box, but they couldn't. And in, they kept attacking and uh, in the last, the last attack, the Somalis broke it. Um, the man of the action was Corporal Adana D. He got his military medal for attacking two Japanese machine gun teams located either side of Italian HQ and killing uh, both of the gun crews. Now, he's my kind of soldier. I like to think of him uh, then going and saying, uh, having a good breakfast and then saying to the sergeant major or the company commander, right, what are we doing next? But he wouldn't have got his breakfast because the cooks couldn't believe it. They they hadn't seen any Japanese yet, but all of a sudden with the Japs overrunning the position, there were Japs everywhere. So the cooks and everybody else in HQ company dropped their tools, picked up their rifles and bayonets and um, charged round. Uh, the hillside, bayoneting Japs to death. And it was so, so ferocious that the Japanese in the end turned around and ran away, some of them uh, throwing their weapons away with them. So the Japanese withdrew from here, but they, the brigade had killed 1,200 of them. That's a lot of Japanese to kill, whilst losing 169 all ranks killed from the brigade and 443 wounded and 30 missing in action. No other East African brigade experienced harder fighting. The, the brigade then went back uh, to India and, and joined the division. Right, for the last brigade, we're back in the Arica. This brigade, 22, had a Nyasa battalion a Northern Rhodesia Battalion and a Southern Rhodesia Battalion. The Southern Rhodesia Battalion was called the Rhodesian African Rifles. The Northern Rhodesians, I've told you, had their own called the Northern Rhodesia Regiment. So only the Nyasas were batched KAR. The, the brigade was put into a rear area to um, uh, familiarize itself, and then it was put on a long march down towards Tongup. And the strategy of the chaps um, commanding things in the Arakan was to stop the Japanese garrison in the Arakan from getting to the east and across the Irrawaddy River. So the 22 Brigade was ordered to go up a great big valley called Panwishon and uh, get up to the road running uh, across to Prome and block it so that the, the Japanese couldn't get away. Perhaps we, yes, the, these are good photos. When I say Panwishon was a, a big valley, um, this, the Disembarkation scene on the right, that is at the river's mouth, but it's a sizable river, as you can see. Now, the, uh, the picture on the left, it's not actually of, from in the Chong, but Robert has produced it because it, it describes the, um, the scenery and, and the terrain you've got to um, deal with when you're going into narrow Chongs like that. And the the brigade went up it, uh, but it had one big disadvantage. Uh, the enemy were always on the higher ground. 
and the Japs for a time stood the ground and um, the, the fighting was quite intense. Uh, supplies came in by air. I'll just, just go through the, um, I've given a man of the action for every battalion. Corporal Atiba Limamba from Nyasaland got, uh, should have got a military medal, but the, the, the people in the back rooms put it down to mentioning dispatches. When on patrol, the Japanese suddenly attacked and mortally wounded the patrol commander. Atiba Limamba took control of the patrol, organized covering fire, and crawled forward to recover the dying patrol commander who his section then carried to the patrol base. Having found out where Japanese were, uh, allied artillery fire and hurricane bombers and Spitfire attacks came in to soften up the Japanese, but uh, that, that didn't always work. Simon Bander, a corporal in the Northern Rhodesia Regiment, got, did get a military medal. He went out on a fighting patrol that had a contact uh, and his section were left isolated instead of just creeping back to um, his own position uh, where his battalion was, he found an enemy route and ambushed it, uh, killing five Japanese. A really good example of uh, initiative by a, a young junior leader. The brigade moved out of Tanlewi Chong over towards another Chong, Tonguk Chong, and the Rhodesian African rifles attacked uh, and took two important positions on the very steep Chevalier Ridge feature, losing six Ascari killed and 24 Ascari wounded. The man of the action here was Major Stanley Morris, a company commander in the Rhodesian African rifles, recommended for the military cross, but awarded and mentioned in dispatches. When his leading platoon lost momentum in the attack, due to receiving effective enemy fire, he went forward, led his men along a very narrow ridge into the enemy's position and captured it. The Japs kept fighting until they'd got all their men down the road to pro. Then the British heard all the uh, spare Japanese ammunition being fired off um, and knew the, the action was over. It got, heavy monsoon came in and the higher authority decided that aircraft that had been dropping supplies to the brigade should now move to support the big battles in central Burma. So that ended that the brigade's uh, fighting in Arakan, but the brigade was not sent back to India like all the rest of the division and the other brigade had been. It was used in central Burma to round up recalcitrant Japanese who did not believe in their nation's surrender. Um, and also to fight local bandits who, Burma was in turmoil, um, a lot of people, well, different people wanting power. Uh, and, and these dacoits uh, would come and attack any, any place they could to get food, money, or, um, or weapons. But uh, so the lads didn't have a boring time. They had something to do. Casualties in the Chong fighting have been three officers, 56 at Skari, killed in action, five officers, two British senior ranks, and 141 Ascari wounded and two Ascari missing. Right. I'm ending now by saying 11 East Africa Division did whatever it was asked of and with a fine spirit. Its employment in Burma was fully just, justified. And on those big pillars on the Rangoon War Memorial, there are 655 names of King's African Rifles and East African Forces personnel. Right, thank you. Well, thank you, Harry. It's just a reminder of the, the epitaph that we know so well, the second division epitaph at Kahima, which many of you have been to see. Um, we need to expand our understanding of the epitaph to say, when you go home, tell them of us, Indian, West and East African, Britain, American, Burmese, Canadian, and everyone else from across the British Empire and Commonwealth and say, for your tomorrow, we gave our today. 
Um, so often we are minded to think only of those in our own country who fought and, um, and, uh, and sacrificed their lives uh, for freedom. Uh, it was, of course, a much wider campaign. Uh, Harry's books, uh, two volumes on the King's African Rifles are available. There's a link on the Kahima Educational Trust website to them um, and uh, you can buy them. And um, the maps, I have to say, are absolutely outstanding. And, uh, and Harry's analysis of the campaign, which you've received a summary of tonight is, is absolutely first class. So Harry, thank you very much indeed. I'll hand back now to, to Sylvia May, Sylvia. Well, thank you, Harry. Thank you, Rob. As always, a hugely interesting and informative talk on a subject little known in the general scheme of things. As some of our viewers tonight are already saying, this deserves a much wider audience. So thank you both very much. There's been one or two questions. Um, well, if you wouldn't mind looking at the Q&A, Rob, there were a couple that came in on chat. Um, Chanda asked, what were the relationships like between the East Africans and the Indian troops? Do you know the answer to that? Um, I don't think there are any significant problems between the Africans and the Indians. In fact, um, I, I can't think of the top of my head of any evidence. Uh, certainly my studies of the, the West Africans indicates that they work together particularly well. Um, Clive has asked a question about African troops involved in the Dutch East Indies. I don't think they did, Clive. I think uh, they were most of the um, African troops, there may well have been exceptions, but certainly the 11th Division went back and actually the two extra brigades, 28 Brigade and 22, were sent back to uh, Africa in, in, in 1946. So they, they avoided those operations in Indochina and, uh, and Africa. Um, now, it's very interesting, actually, uh, Jerry's question about the African troops. It's very interesting. There's a lot of evidence from um, the early days in Africa that the Japani, as the Africans called the, the, the Japanese, uh, they, they were recognized to be a threat. And as Harry said, the men went to fight the Japanese because they regarded them to be a little bit like the Italians uh, coming in uh, to fight uh, the, the British Empire and, and, and destroy the, the structures of civilization, we want to put it that way, that they, that they recognize. And, uh, there was very little, um, there's not a huge amount of work on this. Harry will probably have um, an answer to this as well, but I don't think there's much evidence, is there, Harry, of people not understanding what they were doing. Africans knew exactly what they were doing. They did. Um, they didn't like it. Uh, so, so they say, uh, after the war was over, after the bombs had been dropped, because there was a big chipping problem in getting people out of Burma and India and, and back to Africa or Europe. And uh, it was so bad that actually the RAF um, went on strike in, uh, in India because they weren't being sent home. Anyway, uh, I think the Africans were more philosophical and uh, uh, they, if you read between the lines, the lads quite enjoyed meeting um, you know, Indian girls, uh, never mind the, the soldiers. So I don't see any problem there uh, of, um, they, they, were, they were both doing the same thing. And, you know, the, they were simple working blokes and they got off. Yeah. There's a final question from John Hinchcliffe, of course, who knows Burma extremely well. John took me around Burma in 2005. And his question, um, Harry, is did the powers of Juju come into it? Say that again, please. Did the powers of Juju, so did um, uh, African uh, black magic, was that, was that used uh, against the Japanese in any way, shape or form? I wouldn't know, but I expect so. But, and I say that because just only about 20 years ago, I was working on a gold mine in Africa and um, I went out for, on a patrol and, um, the lad I was with said, oh, the witch doctor lives there. And so this is, this is today, you know, uh, if the lads, the lads would use it, yes, um, but it isn't part of regimental history. Yeah, okay, fabulous. Thank you very much indeed for those three questions. Sylvia. Yes, well, thank you very much. And any that we haven't got to tonight, as I say, we will get to on email. 
Well, we're now into our third year of creating these webinars and we're in the process of planning a full program for the autumn and indeed for 2024, which of course, as you probably all know, um, is the 80th anniversary of the Battle of Kahima next year. So we will be, we're putting on a, a, a big program and as soon as we have um, speakers and dates confirmed, I'm sure we'll be getting those dates up onto the website for you. Meanwhile, you will see, we will be seeing many of you in York on the 5th and 6th of July. On the 6th, we'll be holding the annual remembrance service outside of York Minster, when families of veterans, serving soldiers, historians all gather to remember. The service is held alongside the second division memorial stone replica situated in the Dean's Garden, after which we'll all be going back to Infar Barracks for lunch. On the previous evening, you will have a chance to listen to Rob speak live when he will be talking about his new book, Reconquest of Burma. And afterwards, there'll be an opportunity to mingle and chat, have a glass of wine and a canopy or two. And I'm sure that Rob will also be happy to sign copies of his books, which we'll have available. And I'm delighted to say that Harry will also be there. He's coming over just for that. And um, and I'm sure that they will both be delighted if any of you want to follow up with them uh, with any questions. There are still tickets available uh, from me or from the website. And copies of many of Rob's books will be available for sale, as will Harry's co-authored book, A Road to Kahima, which KET published a few years ago. Rob mentioned it at the beginning, but just to recap, it covers the lives and battle accounts of many Naga veterans who fought alongside the British or in non-combatant capacities, such as the stretcher bearers and water carriers and so on. So both these books will be available from our online store, where we also have a fine array of Naga clothes and jewellery, as well as a comprehensive selection of titles on the Burma campaign. So that's all from us now, but we look forward to seeing some of you in York and to bringing you our next webinar in the autumn. Thanks for joining us and cheerio for now. Bye-bye. Good night.